No one can watch the nightmare that's the reality of life and death in Syria today with indifference and without a feeling that somebody should do something. As a friend of uh, mine recently counseled another friend who had said, let's just forget about it. Uh, go to the doctor and get an MRI to see if your heart has turned to stone. But the question is who? And then a second question is what? What exactly do you do? So who could do something just right to stop the killing or significantly reduce the violence and pacify Syria? Painfully, the answer is whoever determined to do so. In the United States, there's always this uh, temptation to say that the government should be doing something. We're seeing this horror play out on our television sets. And in foreign nations, frequently there is a temptation to say, this is awful. What's the United States going to do about this? So as an opening question for all of you, whose responsibility is this? Is it America's? Is it some other set of countries? Is it the UN's? Who should be handling this? Andrew? So I'd say there's definitely many, multiple, many mechanisms, many move, moving pieces that have to be harnessed in this case. And so you have organizations like the United Nations, you have the Arab League involved, you have Syria's neighbors involved, all of which have to be involved to some degree. However, of course, we're trying to get to the point is, is the United States going to take the lead on this case? And you have to weigh sort of this classic conundrum of, is the United States responsible for every single humanitarian disaster that is out there? And if so, or if not, well, after that question, can we actually advance the situation and make it better rather than worse? But Andrew, why is the U.S. more responsible for this than the Germans or the British or the French or the Saudis or the Indians or the Chinese? You're certainly right that uh, I, mean, I would say all of the, and just like as, as you framed it before, that no country views this with a heart of stone. And so they all have to play a role in it. But the question in terms of practicality, who has, the, who has the power and influence with the important players, and I would say that list includes things like, uh, especially a starting list would be European nations, the Arab League, Russia, United States, China, UN Security Council members, and so you start from there. Rebecca, does that make sense to you? I mean, when you think about uh, capability, it's one thing, but the responsibility would seem to belong to many other countries than the United States. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that you frame this question in terms of who should do something versus what is possible to do and who can do something and then who will. And I think that, you know, it's, it's hard to say who should. I mean, who should? It's everyone, right? Like, we would like to live in a world where people don't sit around and let horrific things happen in other countries to citizens who, you know, ostensibly didn't do anything, who didn't do anything wrong. It's like, who should do something? You know, the United Nations should function in such a way that they would intervene and do something that would prevent this kind of conflict, I think. That's the world that I would like to live in. But in reality, that's not the case at all. Okay, if we go back to sort of frameworks that may be relevant here. Uh, there's a norm, at least uh, advocated by many people, uh, including our new ambassador to uh, the UN, our former colleague Samantha Power, uh, called the Responsibility to Protect, R2P. And in a 2005 uh, document, uh, 191 UN member states agreed, and I quote, to use appropriate diplomatic, humanitarian, and other peaceful means to help protect populations from genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and crimes against humanity, close quote. So the text is not uh, binding, but R2P advocates will be arguing that should a government fail to protect its own people, this norm requires states to do something, to take collective action, including up to military action if necessary, to protect these populations. So what about that? Well, you may remember that, that uh, Responsibility to Protect Advocates praised President Obama for intervening in Libya. And while he didn't use the phrase Responsibility to Protect, when you listen to his words right around the time, that is clearly what he was uh, saying. But he was also saying at that moment that there were times when the United States would fail to act because it wasn't in its interest necessarily to do so. He left a huge loophole. So, if not the UN or the US, who else could act? Now, some say Syria's neighbors could, Turkey could, Saudi Arabia could, the Gulf states, but others say, well, 
wait a minute, if they had the power to go do this, they would have done it by now. And they also say they simply don't have the kind of military options, the ability to set up a no-fly zone, to send in covert forces uh, that the United States has to do this effectively. Well, wait a minute. I mean, uh, Turkey is a big country. Syria is a little country. Turkey has a big army. China has a big army. India has a big army. The Europeans spend a lot of money on defense for themselves. Saudi and Qatar are both bigger financially, huge financially, compared to Syria. So there are plenty of other people who, quote, could do something. It's just that they you would know. much prefer for you to do something. Well, that's right. And uh, they also, they all read the papers, as it turns out. And uh, they notice that we've spent the past 10 years wrapped up in two lengthy ground wars where we thought we could change the nature of a country that we didn't fully understand. Um, Jess, as you hear this play out, uh, what are you hearing? Two different things, responsibility to protect and national interest? Yes, and I think that you also just made a great point about Iraq and Afghanistan and how that's impacting things and that we, we need to think about who has the capabilities to stop the killing in the short term and who has the capabilities to fix the problem in the long term and that we, we've learned that those are not necessarily going to be the same countries or militaries. Absolutely. Very, very big point to think longer term rather than shorter term. One Any thing, other? One thing I would add to that is that it's in the, even in the last um, 20 years, it's been multiple times when the international community and neighbors of countries in conflict have, we have ca essentially called 911 to the United States and to Europe to act. And so we have most recently cases just in Libya and Mali where Europe took the lead with a little bit of cooperation from neighbors and it turned out to be a much better place. So they see that, they notice that Europe is probably more capable, that the United States is more capable than we might say we are. Well, that, that's a good point, but, and we can take this up later on, but it's worth remembering, Andrew, that the NATO forces that went into Libya ran out of ammunition, and the U.S. had to supply it to them, firing against a country that wasn't shooting back. That tells you something. And that in order to get to Mali, the French needed to bomb a ride on American aircraft and to be provided intelligence and reconnaissance from American sources. So you might before, wonder, you might wonder what the, right? you might wonder what they're getting for their multi-billion-dollar defense <laughs> budgets, other than a marching band. Yeah. Well, well, that's true. So let me summarize where we are, if, at least uh, briefly. Okay. So what's the reality if we look at this this tragedy? I would say Syria's neighbors, Turkey, uh, Jordan, Israel, are essentially trying to protect themselves from the spillover and provide sanctuary for refugees. But then call in 911 for somebody else to pay the price of killing and dying to make a difference on the ground there. Well, that's not quite the full picture, uh, Graham, because there are others who are actually spending blood and, and treasure there. Uh, Summer, what do, you, what do you think it looks like right now? Well, there are several different actors involved in, in the ongoing conflict. So, I mean, there are Hezbollah fighters on the ground in Syria. Um, some 200 plus advisors from Iran's Quds Force. Uh, there's a steady flow of jihadist fighters, even as many as a thousand from Europe and Al Qaeda in Iraq. There are many Arab youths who have become involved, people who have come from neighboring countries to take part in the conflict. And it's deep seated in a lot of regional dynamics that I think many onlookers don't fully understand. Well, Summer, that's a really interesting list because uh, you've described a lot of people who are intervening, but they're not all intervening on the same side. So Hezbollah, which is on the American terrorism list, they've been supporting Assad. Uh, Iran's Quds, Quds Force, uh, which the United States uh, has on its list of unfriendlies, is also supporting them. But then think about the people who are trying to oust Assad. So that includes all those jihadist fighters who you've been describing, who have remarkably been getting the lion's share of those weapons that have flowed into uh, to Syria so the far. The Al Nusra group, who's the most effective fighters, and they are actually a Al Qaeda affiliate. Right, Al Qaeda in Iraq. So if we went in in a bigger way, we'd be going in on the side of Al Nusra and Al Qaeda. That would be really hard to explain in a Senate hearing, don't you think? So in the jungle of international relations at Syria today, uh, the, uh, at this point, whomever cares to join the fight 
is welcome, uh, as we can see. Uh, but uncomfortable as it is, most of us will settle on calling on somebody else to do it. Well, let's in the next segment, Graham, take a look at what President Obama has said we're doing, and then let's look at what we're really doing. Two good questions.